I hear from time to time on the radio or TV or you know, people just tell me that there's this thing called unclaimed money. Millions of dollars of inheritance, stocks, utility credits, and forgotten bank accounts that are supposedly out there, but they have no owner. Have you guys heard about this thing? That Okay, some of you. It's larger than I imagined. I did a little research this week, and I found on the U.S. Treasury Department website that they are holding $16 billion in savings bonds that have matured but have gone unclaimed. What happens is these bonds mature over 20 or 40 years, and in those kind of increments, it's not that uncommon for the original holder uh, to forget that they had them or to pass away, and the beneficiaries kind of get lost, and nobody actually ever gets the money. Wow. <laughs> now, before you open up your phone and look to see if some of that belongs to you, just pay attention to the, you do that after church, but I just want you to imagine a person who maybe is uh, in financial distress, and uh, there they are having struggles they're trying to make ends meet when the whole time over there in the bank account uh, there is thousands of dollars that legitimately and legally belong to them except they're ignorant of their own inheritance. Why? Because the communication of that treasure somewhere along the line was broken. Probably not intentionally, quite by accident. Uh, but nonetheless, it was broken. What a shame. How unfortunate. Well, the reason why I'm sharing that illustration is because, friends, I assert this morning that a similar thing has happened with a rich treasure of truth that is from God that is largely not being passed down to this generation today. Uh, the theology of God that I'm talking about is the theology we find when we go outside and observe His creation. Probably not intentionally, but as generations have gone by, uh, we have, to some degree, become more and more separated from the inheritance of this truth that we find uh, outdoors. But God desires us to know this. The Centers for Disease Control estimates that today the average American spends 90% of their time indoors. 90% of their time indoors. Uh, the New York Daily News reported that the average American watches between 30 and 40 hours of television every single week with the highest amount of time being recorded by those who are 65 years and older. Friends, as little as 100 years ago, it was much easier for people to connect with God's creation outside. But since watching TV, playing video games, or just wasting time on social media has become so prevalent, we don't spend as much time outdoors anymore. Instead of working in... Uh, uh, outside in nature, oftentimes we work in an office building behind a desk under fluorescent lights. Instead of uh, walking or riding horses and enjoying the landscape as we travel along across the way, we spend our time enclosed in cars and uh, the landscape just kind of zooms by so fast that we can't even really stop to take notice. Instead of going to the grocery store, people used to plant seeds and harvest these things uh, from the ground. Now, my point is not an indictment on the 21st century or our society. That's a different message altogether. My point is that because of this, some of our appreciation of nature and God's lessons for us out there through His creation are being lost. One of the only people writing about this is theologian T.M. Moore, uh, who wrote a book describing the plea for creational theology. Listen to this quote. Occupied with the affairs of the world, most people trudge through their daily routines of trade and toil, unmindful of the shimmering and beckoning around them. They take creation for granted. Having shod their feet with the comforts of material existence, they surround themselves with an abundance of things, preferring these rather than for any first-hand experience of God revealing Himself in what He has made. So this morning I have an invitation for you. And the invitation is, would you come on a journey with me outside? Not literally. It's a little cold out there. But would you come on a journey with me outdoors and experience uh, the joy of rediscovering some theological truth that is found actually not in God's special revelation, but in His general revelation in the book of nature? If so, please turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I was greatly helped in this passage about 12 years ago when I read a little book called The Secrets of the Vine by Bruce Wilkinson, also a Dallas Seminary grad. Uh, this book is really uh, short. It's a quick read. 
I found them, actually. It's $9.99, but I found a bulk order for $2 each. And so there's some available out there on the foyer table. If you got two bucks, great. Take that as, as, a, as a donation. If you don't have the money, just take a book anyway. I know you'll be blessed uh, by reading his book. But today, this passage in John chapter 15 contains these profound truths that we're going to talk about that are found in God's creation. And if you really understand, they will really change your life. They will absolutely change your life. And so as you're turning there, just remember the context of John chapter 15. Here we are. It's the night before Jesus died on the cross. He's gathered together with his closest friends, and he's unpacking with them his last words and some nuggets of truth before he dies. Last time in chapter 14, we saw that he taught the truth about heaven. If you remember that, say amen. amen. Notice the last verse in chapter 14 before we flip over to 15. It says there at this point in the teaching that they left the upper room. Do you see that? And we know that as he left, there was a vineyard close by. And I like to think, it doesn't really say this, but I like to think that maybe Jesus saw that vineyard and he stopped and began to unpack this teaching there for his disciples as they walked along the way. And so we'll look at chapter 15 starting in verse 1. If you're ready, say amen. amen. I invite you to stand at this time in honor of God's word as we take a look at it. Verse 1 starts like this. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may, be more, it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him... He it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full." There ends our reading of God's Word. You may be seated. The first thing I want to look at in this parable is the different parts that you see. So here's a picture of the kind of vineyard that he's talking about. Up on the screen, you can see kind of the vine coming off the ground, and then the branches are coming off the top there of the vine. It's important for you to understand this, because if you want to actually understand how you change as a Christian, it's very different than changing in any other area of your life. The nature of Christian change is different from the nature of any other kind of change. The world thinks about change typically in terms of hard work, in terms of uh, discipline. But that's not the kind of change that you see if you go into a vineyard. That's not the kind of fruit that you get if you go into a garden. You don't look at a vine inside of a vineyard and you see the vine going, fruit. No, you don't walk into an orchard, you don't go into a garden and see the, 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 the branches struggling to produce that kind of fruit. It's just natural and it's, and it's organic and it's almost uh, effortless. Because the result here is being connected to the vine, we are transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, and because His life is inside of us, He produces this life Himself. The fruit is not really produced by us, it's produced by the Holy Spirit. That's why it's called in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's His fruit. So let me be clear about what this parable means. And you can kind of follow me along on your outline there. The first point is this. The vine is Jesus Christ. Can we say that together? The vine is Jesus Christ. He says in verse 1, I am the vine. Jesus is the vine which comes out of that ground. And His roots go down into eternity. Deep, deep down into the very depths of the Godhead Himself. And then he comes out of the ground, connects himself with you and with me. Uh, this is what Peter the Apostle meant when he said, you are partakers of the divine nature. It means you participate in the life of the Godhead itself by being connected to this vine. And friends, that's why you and I have any kind of hope of changing. What habit could be so entrenched within me that the life of God flowing through me could not lift that habit out? There is none. 
That's why the scripture says with man, things are impossible, but with God, all things are possible. The change that the Holy Spirit can bring about in my life is powerful and effective. Just think about the power of organic or natural or botanical growth that you see out there in nature. One time, Pastor Pastor D. Campbell Morgan was giving this illustration, and he said that he was walking through a cemetery, walking through a graveyard, and he had noticed something interesting there in the graveyard that caught his attention. Over there in England, he was walking through the cemetery, and he saw this huge marble stone slab uh, that was marking somebody's grave. But years ago, an acorn had kind of gotten underneath of that grave, 600 years ago to be exact, and out of that acorn, of course, as you know, came a shoot, and out of that shoot eventually came a tree, and then that tree grew up so strong over time that it actually split the marble in half. That's powerful. Now, common sense would tell me, here's an acorn, here's a big marble slab. Which one's going to win? No brainer. Marble slab's going to win every time, right? Wrong. The acorn wins every single time. That's the power of organic growth. That's the kind of power God puts on the inside of you through His Holy Spirit. In fact, if you have the Gospel of John open, just flip over to chapter 16 and verse 7 and take a look at what Jesus says there. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send Him to you, meaning the Holy Spirit. And then He came to them and He comes to you and I. And if the Spirit of God lives on the inside of you, He will grow powerful and good fruit that is His fruit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. You can count on it. Christian growth is powerful. You see in verse 5 of this text, chapter 15 and verse 5, Jesus says, without me you can do nothing. You see that? With Him though, all things are possible. In fact, in verse 7, he goes on to say, whatever kind of fruit you want, you can have it. Ask for whatever you wish. Now, when he says that, he doesn't mean what the prosperity preachers think he means. He doesn't mean you can ask me for a Rolls Royce and poof, there's a Rolls Royce, like a penny in a fountain kind of thing. Look at the context. He's talking about fruit. Ask me for whatever kind of fruit you want produced in you, and I will give that to you. Any kind of fruit you want to bear, any kind of character quality that you see in me, he says, ask of me, draw it out from me, and I'll produce that same kind of fruit inside of you too. Amen? This is why you should never become cynical as a Christian. You should never go, and eh, what's the use of trying to change this anymore? This is, the, this is why you can always have hope, because nothing is impossible with God, because Christian change is powerful. So the vine is Jesus Christ. Let's move on to number two. The branch is the believer. Can we say that? The branch is the believer. He says, you are the branches. Speaking to his disciples, to his friends. And today, of course, this applies to you and me. We are the branches. We're connected to Christ. We have his life flowing through us. In fact, if I could, can I push the metaphor a little bit more? The sap here in the vine and the branches, I would say, is kind of like the Holy Spirit. The sap is flowing through him and it flows into us and he gives his very very life flow into us through his Holy Spirit. Now some people have a misunderstanding here and they say, well, exactly who bears the fruit? It's God, but it's me and am I responsible? And they think, well, I'm not really responsible to bear the fruit because it's God who bears the fruit. That's not really a complete thought. If you look at verse 16 in this text of chapter 15, Jesus says this, I appointed you to go and bear fruit. The verb go there is a command. It's in the imperative. You you should go and bear, in the active voice, you should bear a fruit, which means that's your job. You've been appointed by God to bear fruit. And of course, it's ultimately God who gets the glory, and it's ultimately God who's at work inside of you and me. But now that we are in Christ, we are in a partnership with Him. The Apostle Paul describes the partnership in this kind of language. I can do all things through Christ Christ. Who strengthens me? Do you see how it's both there? It's not either or, it's both and. The branch is the believer, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Let's move on. The third thing you notice in this parable is is that the vine dresser is God the Father. Can we say that together? The vine dresser is God the Father. He says, my Father is the vine dresser. Your translation might say gardener. Same thing. Now it's important for you to understand what the Father does. Look at verse 2. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. See that? And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. That's the work of the vine dresser who's God the Father. Now a vine dresser basically has one main mission, one main purpose, and it's to get the most amount of grapes out of a branch that's physically possible. And he works all season long, all year long on that particular goal, and he works on the, he works on the branches, he doesn't work on the vine, to produce as many grapes as he can. 
And he does this in two ways. You can jot them down. Number one, he takes away fruitless branches. Number two, he prunes fruitful branches. Number one, he takes away fruitless branches. Number two, he prunes fruitful branches. Another way to say that is he cuts away the lifeless and he cultivates the living. He cuts away the lifeless and he cultivates the living. One of those works is the work of destruction. The other work is the work of discipline. One is destruction, one is discipline. If you're with me, say amen. Amen. This is the idea behind that cryptic saying that he says in Luke 8.18, to the one who has more, to, to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has, will be taken away. See, one of them is a work of discipline, the other is a work of destruction. So that's the work of the vine dresser, who is God the Father. And the last part of the parable is the fruit. And the fruit is the believer's good works. Can we say that together? The fruit is the believer's good works. Now, some of you might say, bummer, God wants me to work? Answer, yes, that's why you were created. You were created to work. In fact, Ephesians 2 describes this perfectly. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good, what? Works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Which is an amazing thing if you think about it. Almighty God was up in heaven and He said, I have this work that needs to be done. And then He created a person to do that exact work that He had in mind and accomplish that exact job that he has for them. Isn't that cool? Now don't misunderstand something here. Let me ask you this question. Can I do enough good works that God will look at me and go, hey Dave, I am impressed. I mean, you've earned your way into heaven by these good works. Can I do that much good works? No. Remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9 right before that describes how we are saved. For by grace you are saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. There's only one work that will get me into heaven, only one work that will get you into heaven, and that's the work of Jesus Christ on the cross on your behalf. Amen? Amen. But after you've accepted His work, God has good works prepared for you to do as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are the four parts of the parable. Now I want you to notice in this text... There is four different levels of fruit bearing, if you will. There's four different levels of fruit bearing. And every person in this room fits into one of these four different levels. Okay? The first level is the level of no fruit at all. This person has no fruit at all. They're found in verse 2. Take a look. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And then again, he picks up this same thought in verse 6. If you let your eyes drop down to verse 6, it says, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now there is some debate about these verses. I'll just give you my opinion. As far as I can tell, this is referring to a non-believer who has some association with Christ or his church, but who is not really part of the vine. This is a person who says they're a Christian, but it's what we call a false profession of faith. A good example of this in the context right here is Judas. Judas was with Jesus for three years. He traveled along with Him, heard His teaching, but he was never really part of Jesus Christ. In fact, he was undermining the whole operation. It was a false profession of faith. Now, this person still exists today. The same kind of person. They they say they're a Christian. Maybe it's culturally uh, just relevant for them to say, yeah, I'm a Christian. But it's not genuine. And you know that because there is no fruit in their life. No growth in character. No growth in holiness. No desire to pursue God in righteousness. There's no fruit of the Holy Spirit. Now in the context here, what is the distinguishable mark here of someone who follows Jesus Christ? It's found in verse 8. By this you will show that you are my disciples. How? If you bear much good fruit. But this person... They don't have fruit. Therefore, they show the opposite is the case. And so this is the kind of person who has never really accepted the Lord, who is uh, kind of pre-faith. They have not made the Lord Jesus the Lord of their lives, and they're just kind of playing games. Now, I say that like it's really not a game. It's a very serious warning here. In fact, uh, Jesus says, you don't belong to me. One day you'll be cut down and thrown into the fire. Very serious language, very fearful language. And so can can I just say something serious? Just for a moment, if you're here this morning and you describe yourself as a Christian, is it possible that before God and before Christ, you still need to acknowledge your own need of salvation from Him today? Is it possible that you've presumed, that you've assumed things are right between you and God, 
but you've never actually repented of your sin? If so, I would encourage you to make today the day that you do that, and I'll give you an opportunity to do that at the end of this message. So this person is not a Christian. It's not that they need to clean up their act. It's that they need to get saved. Okay, Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And this person is dead. That's the first level. And the way you go from level one to level two is through repentance. Now, once you become a Christian, there are kind of three more levels after that that Jesus explains here. There's the level of fruit. There's the level of more fruit. And then finally, there's the level of much fruit. Because as branches grow, as you mature, uh, the larger you get, the more you're able to bear more and more fruit. And God eventually wants everybody to get to this stage over here of more, uh, much fruit. Now, the million dollar question is, how do you get from one level to the next level? And the answer is in the text, and it's found in what happens in between these levels, these green arrows. That's how, that's kind of the secret of how you go from one level to the next level. The first secret we already talked about, which is repentance. You need to repent and be grafted into the vine and become a Christian. Now, to get to, to level, from level two to level three, he describes the process here, and it's the process that it's called pruning. Do you see that? At the end of verse two, he says, Every branch that bears fruit he prunes so that it will become more fruitful. To prune means to cut. Sounds painful. But it's for our good. Now when it comes to the vineyard, this is a technique that the gardener uses because the wise gardener knows that you have a choice. Either you can have a lot of leaves or you can have a lot of fruit, but you can't have both. Because you see, there's only so much sap that comes up through that vine and goes into the branches. But if you have so many offshoots and so many leaves happening, there's very little sap left that can go into the grapes. And so the gardener comes along and prunes this vine from time to time throughout the season. Why? To redirect the sap from the branches and the leaves into the fruit. And so if I could put it simply, pruning simply means this, to cut back and to bear more. To cut back to bear more. But what does that mean spiritually? Well, it means this. When you're not being fruitful, or when God wants you to be more fruitful, He intervenes into your life to stimulate you to bear more fruit through a process the Scripture describes as discipline. Discipline. Here's a misunderstanding. When I become a Christian, my life will be easy after that. No. In fact, it may get harder. Hebrews 12.8 says God treats you as a son now and disciplines you as his own child. This is important because God is in the business of pruning. There's a lot of different pruning shears that he uses uh, on me. He's used physical things, sometimes financial things. One of his pruning tools can be relational. Now that doesn't mean every time you're sick it's because you have some sin in your life. But it is a tool, physical ailments. It is a tool for God to prune me in that way. And it doesn't mean... That necessarily I've been going down the wrong track. It just means that he wants to redirect my efforts and focus my efforts on a track that he wants me to go down. Or I could be falling into sin and he wants to get my attention. And sometimes, I've got to be honest with you, I'm stubborn. And as I look back on my own life, there are times where I have been so stubborn, I just would not listen to God. And I left God only one choice. That is to get the pruning shears out and to go to work in order to get my attention. I was just fighting with God, boxing with God which is a losing battle. But it takes me and my thick, dumb head a long time to realize that. And so pruning has a refining purpose. Charles Spurgeon has a great quote about this. Listen to what he says. I owe more to the fire and the hammer and the file than anything else in my Lord's workshop. I sometimes question whether I have learned anything except through the rod. I can relate. And as a pastor, I can relate. I find it fascinating that when I ask people about key moments in your life where like, you really grew and God showed you something new, rarely, I say never, does anybody tell me, well, there was that time where I bought this brand new house and it just really changed everything. Or there was this, this car that I got, and ever since I bought that car, my life has never been the same. No, they don't say that. They say, no, that there was this unbelievable trial I had to go through, and I wouldn't wish it upon my worst enemy, but I had to go through that. And after I came through it, God did some amazing work in my life, and you know, it's awful and brutal and I won't want you to go through that but out of that suffering came this refining purpose and out of that pruning came all of this fruit as a result of the work of the vine dresser 
Take a look at this quote from Oswald Chambers. He says this, A saint's life is in the hands of God as a bow and arrow in the hands of an archer. God is aiming at something the saint cannot see. He stretches and strains. And every now and again, the saint says, I cannot stand anymore. Ever been there? But God does not heed. He goes on stretching until His purpose is in sight. Then He lets fly. We are here for God's designs, not our own. So that's how you move from level 2 to level 3, pruning. Level 4. How do we go to that final stage? There's a word repeated ten times in this passage. I wonder if anybody noticed what it was as we were reading the Scriptures. Anybody catch it? It's the word abide. Very good. Abide. Abiding is the key to going to much fruit. Agriculturally, abiding is the idea of a deepening of the connection in between the vine and the branches. So that there might be more nutrients and more water and more fertilizer that flows in between the vine and the branches. And the more deeply they're connected, the more sap comes through. The Greek word abide is the word meno. It means to remain or to dwell or to live or to stay connected somewhere. Spiritually, it's obvious what this means. It means to stay connected with God. Because we grow in our faith, we grow in our character as we grow in our intimacy with Jesus Christ. That's how we grow. You see, the, fr- the Lord wants you to know Him and to understand Him and to know Him intimately as your Heavenly Father. And so He wants you to abide deeper and deeper. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, let me give you two, two practical ways to kind of put this, let the rubber hit the road for you. The first one is this. Jesus says, remain in my word. Do you see that in verse 7? He says He wants His words to remain in you. you see that? Remain in my word. This is why the psalmist says, I meditate on your word day and night. This is why the Bible says, I eat your word like honey. Meaning what? You, you, you put them in your mouth? No, you digest them spiritually. You make them your own beliefs. And you internalize his word deep down into your heart until it becomes part of your psyche and part of your own soul. That's why Colossians 3 says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Friends, if you want to bear much fruit, there is no substitute for cultivating a regular, I would even say daily, devotional time with God every single day. I like to do mine at the very beginning of the day. That's just how I am. That's where I like to pray, read my Bible, meditate on what God has to say so that I might remain in His Word. Again, another great quote I found from Oswald Chambers on this. Get into the habit of dealing with God about everything. Unless in the first waking moment of the day, you learn to fling the door wide back and let God in, you will work on a wrong level all day. But swing the door wide open and pray to your Father in secret, and every public thing will be stamped with the presence of God. Remain in my word. Secondly, the way you abide is to remain in His love. Jesus says, remain in my love. Look at verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. You know, this morning I got uh, a nice <laughs> Valentine's card from my youngest daughter. And uh, I, it just melted me. You know, this, is, this just did it for me. I, you know, uh, she says this, You are my coach leading me to success. You are my basketball encouraging me to make my shot. You are my whistle guiding me through the rough times. I always needed you, Felicity. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm so blessed, right? Here's my question. Does your relationship with God sound anything like that? Does it look anything like my daughter sitting on my lap? Do you cultivate that kind of relationship with your Heavenly Father, a loving relationship? Relationship, Because I submit to you this morning that all of the bad habits and all of the problems that you have in your life and all the things that you can't quite kick and the things about you that you can't quite grow are a direct result of your failure to abide in God's love. So let me ask you, do you believe that God loves you? Not some future version of you. That God loves you right now today because of His Son. You know what the sad thing is? 
The reason why we don't do this is because we find other places to abide than His love. We find other abiding places that we think will give us life, but that are really just a sham. There are many false vines out there that promise us what we think we want. Vines of pleasure, power, fame, or fortune. But those vines produce no life. And ultimately, they lead to destruction. Jesus says, remain in me and remain in my love. Friends, the world doesn't love you. The company you work for doesn't love you. The New York Yankees don't love you. Your favorite dessert doesn't love you. You hear that, Pastor Dave? Okay, got it. But Jesus Christ does love you. Jesus Christ is the true vine, he says in verse 1. Notice that word. He's the true vine. Remain with him. Remain in his love because a fruitful branch abides in the right vine. Amen? So what if we do all this? What will be the results in our life? Well, I want you to see two results in this passage. If you, if you can hang with me, this is good. Can you stay with me a little bit more? Okay. Two results. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be full. Point number one. Fruit bearing brings joy to the believer. Real joy for you, the believer. And as I look back on all the teaching I've ever heard in John chapter 15, this has to be the most overlooked verse in the passage, that's why I want to point this out right here. Do not miss the fact that finding joy is the purpose of the whole teaching here. His purpose, Jesus' purpose here is not pragmatic. It's not to, to teach you these things so that you will accomplish a lot of things. His purpose is not informational. He's not teaching you these things so that you'll understand more clearly. His purpose here is not personal. It's not just so that you, know, you can be the better you. His purpose is emotional and spiritual. It's so that you might have tremendous joy. Because this is what brings true joy, fruit bearing. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what everybody wants? The way is right here in front of us. The first result is joy. The second result, the final result, is found in verse 8. Take a look. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much joy fruit. Fruit bearing brings glory to God. Fruit bearing brings glory to God. Can we say that together? Fruit bearing brings glory to God. I'll close with this story. You know, back in Italy, which is where my in-laws are from, there's a tradition. This is going back a couple hundred years where everybody had a a vineyard. It was very common. And the grapes there in, in that portion of Italy are just delicious. And one time of the year, in the village square, all the owners of all the vineyards, who were the vine dressers, would come to town on the same day. And they would bring their big barrow full of grapes and with their best vine. And everybody would be wondering on that day, who would have the most fruit? And there was an old vine dresser who would come to the town square An old man in his 70s who had been working this trade his whole life. And when he brought his barrow, it was so full and so overflowing with fruit that everybody just... He's the one. And then everyone gasped as they saw a second barrel full of fruit coming around the corner. And then a third barrel of fruit coming along the corner. It was amazing. It was just incredible. And to me, that's just a picture of God. And that's why He wants your life to be so overflowing with fruit. So that people will give glory to God because of His work in you. Amen? Amen. One last verse that caught my attention, then we'll be done. Remember when they told the Israelite tribes to go spy out the land? And you remember, 12 of them went to go check it out, and they found in the land flowing with milk and honey some amazing fruit there. And they brought back the fruit to to kind of give a report of what the land looked like. And it says in, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, that there was two guys needed to carry one cluster of grapes. And I thought, is that possible, Lord? And I I just went to Google. And I put Guinness Book of World Records cluster of grapes, right? And I found this picture. 
And it was so amazing to me. Friends, that's what God wants your life to look like. Because a fruitful life brings glory to God. Amen? Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your work in our life as the vine dresser. Lord, we thank you even for those times where you're forced to take your pruning shears and refine us. Lord, deep down, what we want is to be more like you. And so, God, would you bear that fruit inside of us? Would you take us to the next level of fruit bearing this morning? Because we want to bear fruit for your glory. That's our prayer today. May your sovereign hands come down and help us to bear your fruit. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said... Thank you.